allow me to first just say thank you for working with us as we changed from our regular schedule today for something that is fairly irregular but for accommodating us because of the love we have for Sean and now also for his wife Judith we're looking forward to getting to know her a lot better and making her work soon yes you heard me right little girl in the village of Berkfordshire, Bedfordshire rather, in England, wrote a message to, to someone she cared for greatly. It was a positive response postcard to her sweetheart's proposal. He lived in Clifton, 15 miles away from Bedfordshire. This was back in the day when there was no Gmail, there was no cars that could drive you there quickly, and you had to rely on postal service for things 15 miles away. In her postcard of response, she wrote, Yes, 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 I love you. The postcard was written in 1910. It was delivered in 1969. 59 years later, the poor sweetheart never knew of the loving response. He died in 1929. It was a case of undelivered message of love. How would you like to get a dozen roses for your wife and have them delivered to the wrong house? Or how would you like to order those roses only to have them delivered 59 years later. They wouldn't look like much. See, we like to have our love delivered on time. I remember when I fell in love with my wife, hours was too much. I needed to talk to her now. And if I called or sent an email and she didn't respond within the hour, I wondered what went wrong. Doesn't she like me anymore? Why is she not responding? We need to express our love in a timely manner. The poor fellow never got married. He died, I'm sure, wondering why. On the plus side, or the, not the plus side, the flip side rather, I've worked with a lot of men who have told me when they come and talk to me about why their relationship is not working out. One of the first questions out of my mouth to them would be, well, how often do you tell your wife you love them? To which I can tell you, I regularly hear, I've told her once I loved her, I don't have to tell her every day. And there's your problem. We need to express our love. We need to let them know every day that we love them. Sometimes I'm afraid my wife might get frustrated with how many times I have to tell her or text her little heart emojis. And yes, I'm a big guy, but I'm a teddy bear. <laughs> I love you. You still make my heart go boom, 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 boom. Don't laugh, I do. And she still does. <laughs> in our scripture reading, as I want to read to you a little bit here, John 15, follow in your hearing or, or read with me. Jesus says that we can do better in how we express our love. Follow me. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Like the word there. This is my command, not my counsel, a suggestion. This is my command. And I will tell you that modern love is lacking. 
The Reader's Digest tells us about two girls, ages five and six, and they were playing wedding. Any of you guys ever play wedding? Okay, any of you guys still play wedding? <laughs> Don't lie now. But a mother was overhearing her two daughters playing wedding. And they came to the part where they were making their vows. And one of the girls says, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say will be used against you. You have the right to an, to an attorney. You may now kiss the bride. <laughs> now there's a lot of wisdom in that. Even although it was incorrectly used, we do like to have an archive of things said that we can like, uh -huh, but you said on January 7th, 1989, you told me. There's a great lack of genuine love, an expression of love today in the home, and it's a shame. Even in homes with both partners, there is a monumental lack of love. And not all homes have that. Statistics tell me that 48% of all American households have only one adult in the home. Where is that love? 2.7 million grandchildren live in the home of their grandparents. Almost 3.9 million children ages 25 to 34 still live with their parents. Have mercy. Lauren, get a job. 87% of the graduating class of 2017 moved back in with their parents. The boomerang generation. You just can't get rid of them. I love them. But I need some me time with my missus that makes my heart go boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Many probably wonder if the nest will ever be empty. Almost one out of every three children you see live with one parent in the house. There's a different paradigm that we're facing these days. Somebody told me the other day, Pastor, a home ain't what it used to be. It's a time for genuine love. You've probably read about the story. One day, police entered a home where family members asked for a welfare call and found little Mary Beth huddled in a corner of a very filthy, smelly bedroom. One thin little wrist was securely tied to the bedpost with an electric cord. Her lips were split, swollen. She was beaten by her mother. As authorities carried her carefully out, not to hurt her anymore, she looked over at her mother and said, Mommy, if I die, then will you love me? For Mary Beth, there never was a time for love. But that's not how God is. In John 15, 12, Jesus makes a very strange command. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. That's the type of love that we are to love each other with. How does God love us? What is his love like? See, we need to understand that God loves us unconditionally. Do you understand that word in relation to love? Because if you do, I need you to explain it to me because I don't get it. How do you love someone unconditionally? That no matter what that person does, you still love them. The closest I can come to that is how I feel about my daughter. But she's only eight, she hasn't tested me really yet. <laughs> but see, but I've seen that in my house. I know what I did to my parents and they still love me. And even things that my parents found out years after the fact, when we still visited, I remember sitting down in a hotel in New York City as I was driving them back to the airport to go back to South Africa. They brought up something I didn't know they knew about that happened about 15 years before that. And they said, but we just want you to know. We still love you. You'll always be our loved son. It broke me because I thought I got away with it. 
I thought I would spare them the heartache of it, but they knew about it, and yet they still loved me. Now you may say, well, I disagree with that. Even God gets fed up every once in a while. But no matter what we do, how we act, or what we say, God always loves us. Don't judge. Don't judge someone because they sin differently than you. Love each other. I want you to go back to Proverbs 17, 17 with me. You should all know the scripture. It says, a friend loves at all times. How much of the time? At all time. Who is our best friend? Not a trick question. God loves at all times. The highest lesson you can ever learn in this life is that God never stops loving you. No matter what you do, He loves you with an unconditional love that our language, our culture cannot possibly dare to even try to explain. Don't judge. Love each other. We've got to have some method of purging the cold from our hearts and letting the warmth of Jesus take charge in our life. When I look at what's happening in this world, when I look at what's happening in this country, I have to tell you, I have to ask myself, where is the love? We don't love each other anymore. We try to do whatever we can to destroy the other. I remember when I worked in, in intelligence, we had a department of people that all they did was to dig up dirt on political opponents to use against them in smear campaigns. That's all they did. They got paid six numbers to find dirt. The problem is in today's society, we're not getting paid to do that. We do it because of our political affiliation or because of our political stance. We would be only too happy to dig out dirt on someone if it could make them look worse and us look better. Don't judge. Let's love each other. Jesus Christ is in the business of changing evil, polluted, loveless hearts into pure, sweet ones. Book of Revelation tells us in chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, and yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. See, the river of life provides life for the new Jerusalem. And that river of life is nothing but the symbol of Jesus Christ. And we need to have that water flow through every ounce of who we are. And when you invite Jesus Christ into your life, He can cleanse you of anything you've ever done. It doesn't matter where you've been. Your home can be cleansed of the hatred, of the rage, of the anger, and in its place you can be given real love. Love that you can use to love others. See, the loneliest place in the world is a home that doesn't love. It's pretty tough to live in a house where there is no love. A house where there's always bickering, fighting, kicking. You know how it goes. At least I pray you don't. I think it's time for Christians to recharge the low voltage in their batteries. Love your husband. Love your wife. Love your children. Love those in church next to you. The Reader's Digest a while back said this, getting, getting married is an incredible act of hopefulness. But see, but with Jesus Christ, it can work out. I believe that divorce would be an endangered species if a man would give as much loving attention to his wife as he does to his cars, his boats, his golf clubs, his video games, his chat rooms, and his dog. I believe that 
divorce would be an endangered species if wives gave as much attention to her husband as she does to her group of girls. Her television shows, telephone and Facebook. But I'm going to leave it at that. I'm just sharing some of the statistics of the last five years worth. Love reveals itself. Love needs to be expressed again and again and again. It can't just be led in and say, yes, I love you. But you'll never hear me say that again. By words, by deeds, and by looks, we need to express our love. And I'm not just talking about your spouse or your significant other. I'm talking about the people that you are sitting next to, the people in your neighborhood, the people across the political divide. No matter how they act, no matter whether they reject you or oppose you, no matter if they reject Jesus, by words, deeds, and looks, we need to express our love, Jesus' love. See, Jesus showed love even to Judas as he knew that Judas was about to betray him, and still he loved him. Jesus showed love to Peter when Peter betrayed him. Don't judge. Love each other. Ephesians 5.28 makes this absolutely amazing statement. He who loves his wife loves himself. Isn't that an amazing statement? If you love your wife, you love yourself. Now, we could reword that slightly. If you love your family, you love yourself because your family is a part of you. Wouldn't that be a correct extrapolation of the text? A man who loves his wife loves himself, but if you love your family, you also love yourself. So therefore, if that is the case, in other words, by loving your teenager, you increase your own significance. Love your family. Now, for the exact same reason, we should reword it for Stonehill also. If you love your church family, you love yourself. Because your church family is a part of who you are. Scripture tells us so aptly in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes, whether they worship like you, whether they dress like you, whether they act like you, whether their politics or their lifestyle is like yours, it doesn't matter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that those individuals, you included, should not perish but have eternal life. Now verse 17 is a verse we always skip, but that to me is the crux of the matter. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So when God sent his son Jesus Christ to give you and I saving grace, why is it that we then decide that we are going to condemn people in the church that aren't like us? God did not come to condemn, but to save. So don't judge. Love each other. The small boy kept asking his father, Dad, can we build a clubhouse in the backyard? And the father kept on saying, yes, we will build a clubhouse. Sure, we'll do it. But the father was so involved traveling internationally with work trips all the time. Dad, when you get back, can we build the clubhouse? Yes, son, when I get back, we'll build the clubhouse. But the next week, he was up to, off to another country, to another city, to another state. Dad, can we build that clubhouse? One day, the little boy was hit by a car and rushed to the emergency room in a critical condition. The father rushed to his son's side. The boy got worse. Just before he died, he grabbed his dad's index finger and squeezed it and said, Dad, I guess we're never going to get to build that clubhouse. See, what he really wanted was not to build a clubhouse. He just wanted to spend some time with his dad. He wanted to feel the love. He wanted to find the fellowship and love with his father, but it never happened. 
First John 4, 7 and 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another. This is almost like begging, isn't it? Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. So if at any given point, if there is a person on this planet that you hate because of political affiliation, because of sexual orientation, because of the way they live, because of the fact that they might eat meat and you're a vegan, whatever the case may be, if there is something that makes you not love the person that you are talking to, the Bible says you do not know God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Don't judge. Love each other. Now, every day, love can be hard. It's easy for me, you know, when I turn on the TV and I hear of what's happening in the Far East. I hear what's happening in Darfur, somewhere in Africa, in the Sudan. It's very easy for me to just say, hey, you know, God bless the people. I love them. We know you love them too. But when things happen in our own backyard, when things happen in our own home, that dynamic shifts. When someone in your house comes out of the proverbial closet, suddenly it's not as easy to love. When someone acts differently than the way you raise them, suddenly we realize we don't necessarily love them the way God loves them. But maybe your problem is when your teenager holds the door of the refrigerator open for three hours trying to decide what he or she wants to eat. Or maybe it is when that same teenager does not want to commit and keep to any of the rules that you just made the day before. Maybe your problem is when your teenager just absolutely drives you bonkers. You know, my problem is when the crazy driver slams on his brakes on 35 after he just passed 60 cars to try to squeeze in in front of you and then slams on the brakes in a big pickup truck that I don't have a chance against. That's when it's difficult for me to love. Dude, love is not hard until it gets close to me. When love gets personal, then it gets hard. Now, I don't have a dog that barks all night. But I have a neighbor that has a cat that likes to come and use our yard as a litter box. I don't have a teenager giving me sleepless nights. But my parents had. And I know how I aged my parents overnight. Maybe your problem is that you're just not comfortable with, with what others are doing. Maybe you're just not comfortable with them. Maybe they, um, they just don't talk like you. Maybe they just don't walk like you. Maybe they just don't love like you. But don't discriminate because they sin differently than, you, differently than you, because they are different than you. Don't deflect. Love each other. See, love is not hard until it gets close to us. When it interferes with our comfort zone, when I suddenly don't feel comfortable enough. If you don't comfort feel comfortable with people around you, maybe they're not the issue. Maybe they are not the problem. When love gets personal, then it gets hard. Things that are said in the home pierce our hearts, and it gets tough. When someone pierces my heart with harsh words coming out and attacking me without necessarily even asking questions to understand, but just outrightly condemning me, it breaks my heart into pieces and all the love drains out very quickly. And the hatred begins to refill and there we start and we go at it. This ought not be the case when we regularly fill ourselves with the living water. You know, one day I went to the tire store and they were having a sale on 
and some new puncture-proof tires, and I'd never heard of such a thing. Saying there's this gook that you put into your tires, and even if someone shot a spear right through your tire, the tire wouldn't go flat because there's gook inside it. I don't understand gook. I just know that it's supposed to work. See, our heart is like a tire and Jesus is like the gook. So often people want to stick something in the tire and slash it. Slash our lives, slash our families. Slash you personally. But Jesus is the gook that keeps it all together. When somebody holds a sharp word at you, Jesus is what keeps it together. The next time someone hurls a sharp sword at you, attacking you with that tongue that slices to pieces, Jesus is what keeps it together. See, because when Jesus lives in your heart, Jesus will fill the hole, and then love will always stay in. Matthew 22, 39. Got a couple of minutes here before we cut that wedding cake. This is a summation of the Ten Commandments. The first, love God. But the second is like this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes. I agree with that indeed. We should love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves, no matter who or what your neighbor acts like, no matter who he is. My only question would be, could my neighbor stand that much love? You know, we really love ourselves. If we truly loved our neighbors the way we loved ourselves, they would be freaked out. Because nobody would have ever experienced that much love. Am I right or am I right? You know what I'm talking about. The way some folk pamper their bodies, dress it in its finery and care for themselves, you would wonder what would actually happen if only half of all that affection were given to their neighbors? Or what would happen if only half of all that affection were given to those who are sitting in the seats next to us in church today? Love each other. So you need to understand that love imitates. I remember as a kid, I attended a stop smoking clinic with, with my dad's church. Any of you guys ever remember the old five-day stop smoking clinics? They would show you these hearts. Some of them were like good-looking, healthy lungs and hearts that they had on display, and then they would show you this dirty old lung from someone who smoked. But during this, I remember the one commercial or little caveat that they put on there. I remember this dad sitting fishing with his son. And the dad let up a cigarette as he, after he had cast him to the water, and he just sat there with his fishing rod, and he's just puffing away at his cigarette. And then the camera pans, and you see the little boy sitting next to him with a short little stick copying his dad. Just want to be like dad. It's because love imitates. And when you show love, it'll only take a heartbeat before those around you will start imitating the love that you are showing to those who they are close to. See, this principle is aptly stated in 1 John 3:16. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus laid down his life for us. So what should we do? We should lay down our life. You see how love imitates? If you love Jesus, you will find out what he did and do similarly to those you come in contact with. Love models what love respects. See, and this is the very precise reason we preach from the pulpit that the best way to have good works is to fall in love with Jesus. It'll be a natural consequence of your actions. That's how it happens. Love each other. We begin to take on each other's characteristics. I remember many times in my grandparents' marriage, 
They had people that would walk up to them and say, you guys look like brother and sister. They first were very taken aback until they realized what a compliment. We've all seen it. They lived so close together, so in love with each other, that they started reflecting each other to the point of even looking like each other. Sorry, sweetheart, you're not going to be that good looking in a while if you start looking like me. I don't want to take that too far, because what if a couple doesn't look alike? One quarrelsome husband and wife were sitting in front of a fire one night. They had a survival of the fittest kind of marriage. For years, there were two cats, one on each one's lap, just purring away, snoozing away. And then suddenly the husband piped up, why can't we live in peace like these cats? And his wife snapped back, well, you just tie their tails together like we are and fling them together over the clothesline and see what happens. The Bible says in Amos 3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? See, we need to agree. Love puts the other first. Love each other. A man was parking his car and he started to get out and he noticed a little boy looking at his car. The little boy said to him, sir, wow, that is a nice car. Yes, said the man, this is brand new. It's the only one in the country. Where did you get that nice car? Well, I imported it from Italy. The man said, wow. He said, yeah, my brother gave it to me. Whoa, and the man just knew what the boy was about to say until the boy stumped him by saying, well, I wish I could be a brother like that. See, my brother is crippled and I would like to give him a car just like that to make him feel better about himself. That's love, isn't it? Real love thinks of others first. Love is not selfish. Love is slow to demand. Love is quick to give. Love is slow to belittle. But love is quick to appreciate. Love never harms and love never controls. Love doesn't judge others because they sin differently than you. Love each other. Sean and Judith, here's your scripture to, from this morning that I should have read. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I tell you, our love needs to be lined up with Jesus. And then it will be the right kind of love. How can we come to church and sing songs of love and praise and then go home and with the same mouth yell out hate at people we come in contact with? How can we come to church and sing songs of love and praise and profess to be disciples of Jesus, meaning we will be walking like Jesus, talking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, and not show love and compassion and acceptance to others who came to the same hospital in need of the same loving Savior that you and I need? If that is happening to you, then you need to get your life in alignment. See, we do that with the wheels on our car. Just recently, I was driving in Navasota, and I noticed a car going down the road sideways. It's the weirdest looking car I've ever seen in my life. I guess it was in a wreck of some sorts, but the tail end was over probably about a foot and a half. And it moved sideways forwards. But the one wheel was just doing this. And that's the exact problem we as Christians have when our marriage is not in alignment with Jesus Christ. 
That's the exact problem we Christians have in our relationship with each other in the church is not in alignment with Jesus Christ. We must possess what we profess. Love each other. John 13, 34, Jesus says, now a new commandment I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's a command, it's not a suggestion. Why would he have to command us to love one another? But indeed he has to. It's a strange thing, but when we look at how we live our lives these days, it's like we have cleanly forgotten that Christ himself commanded us to show respect and love to one another. So how should we love? As Jesus loves us, that's how we ought to love one another. When there's no Valentine's cards in the store, does that mean that love is out of season? But why is it that we wait for Valentine's Day to show our significant other that we love them? And usually then with the cheapest box of chocolates that we can because chocolate's expensive over Valentine's Day. But what about February 15th and the rest of the year? Love is never out of season, never. May you have the love of Jesus Christ in your home. And may it begin by loving each other. The legend tells us as I close off in the third century AD, it was a criminal offense to be a Christian and a man was arrested for professing Christ. He was thrown in jail for many years. But one day the jailer asked if the Christian man would help his little blind daughter, Julia. He agreed to help her and educate her and over the years he taught her history, all kinds of mathematics and described the world of nature, history, and its beauties. And one day she asked if God really answered prayer. You see, she wished to pray that God would help her to see. And they knelt down together in that dungeon cell and prayed. As they did, suddenly there was a brilliant light in the prison cell, and Julia shouted, I can see! And she could. Not long after that, the man got ill and finally died. The legend tells us that his name was Valentius. And on the eve of his death, he wrote a last note to Julia, who would now be able to read. And he urged her to stay close to God, and he signed it from your Valentine. It's a legend. We don't know about the truth. But the fact still stands that love is slow to suspect, but very quick to trust. Slow to condemn, but quick to justify. Slow to offend, but quick to defend. Slow to expose, quick to shield. Slow to belittle, quick to appreciate. Slow to demand, quick to donate. Slow to hinder, but very quick to help. 1 John 3, 18 says, Dear children, let us stop just saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. Stonehill, I beg of you, love each other. Amen.